here, the shores of Sydney Harbour in Sydney, Nova Scotia. 23-year-old Cheryl Ann Johnson went out for the evening on May 6, 2001. She was last seen by friends leaving Smooth Herman's Cabaret, 424 Charlotte Street. The next day, Cheryl's body was found on the shore of Sydney Harbour, about a two-minute walk from where she had last been seen. Her pants had been pulled down, and her bra had been pulled up over her breasts. Within days, Cape Breton Regional Police Service determined that Cheryl's drowning death was not suspicious, and they did not pursue an investigation. Cheryl was from Eskasoni First Nation, just over a half hour drive from Sydney. Cheryl was beloved by her family and friends. She loved to cook, she loved to sing, and she loved to swim. Cheryl's loved ones have a hard time believing that she would have put herself into the state of undress in which she was found. They believe that her case is suspicious and deserves further investigation. At any time during this broadcast or afterward, if you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Cheryl Johnson, visit our website. Someone out there has answers. Our goal is to find them. Why were witnesses who were with Cheryl the evening of her death prevented from sharing what they knew? Could law enforcement have closed Cheryl's case too soon? What happened to Cheryl Johnson? Cheryl was the glue that kept her family and her group of friends together. To Trisha Johnson, Cheryl was so much more than an older sister. Well, after my parents split up, she was kind of like our mom. <laughs> she was our caretaker. But then again, she was a, my friend, my best friend. Well, you, you have those sort of people that they're um, the rock. Taken reached out to Cape Breton Regional Police Service to ask some questions related to Cheryl's case and received this response. In response to your proposed questions, Cheryl Johnson's case is not one of a missing or murdered Indigenous woman. A complete police investigation, supported by the medical examiner's report, indicates no foul play or criminal cause in her death. The investigation is closed. However, questions remain for Cheryl's loved ones. Cheryl's friend Shailene Johnson remembers the details of the last night she spent with her, details that haunt her to this day. The last time I seen her, we were at uh, Smooth Herman's Cabaret in Sydney. She came up to me earlier that night and said, Shailene, just talk to me, talk to me, please. Talk to me and let's try to ignore this guy over here. And I said, what guy? And it's like, this guy. And I'm like, what guy? And she goes, shh, there he is. And, and she showed me who he was. She said, yeah, he's bothering me all night. He wants me to go with him, and I don't want to go with him. And I said, well, let's just ignore him. So we continued that way, right? And then we were at the bar having a few drinks, and it became close to closing time. I thought that guy had left. And I guess he might have been, like, creeping asked when we're gonna leave or something, because all of a sudden, before closing, he, he showed up again. And I was just like, wow, this guy's really persistent. You know when you get that feeling about somebody that's not safe? That's the feeling I got from him. The man whose identity is unknown matches the description of a man Cheryl's sister, Trisha, believes she may have been seeing casually at the time of her death. The man was not questioned in her case because law enforcement quickly determined that there was no foul play in Cheryl's death and therefore did not seek out any suspects or witnesses. I went to the bathroom because it was closing time, because I knew it was going to be, it was a Saturday night, and it was going to be some time before a cab came. So I just said, Cheryl, can you wait? Just wait right here. Stay right here in this bar stool, and I'm going to go to the bathroom, and I'll be back. Went to the bathroom, come back, and everybody was gone. I guess there was a fight, and then it, the, the bouncers just said, everyone has to go. And then um, and I went out and I went to look for her. And a few of the people that were all out that night said, oh, she walked down this way. She walked down to the, to the playground near the harbor. And I said, who, she, who was she with? And I was just really worried about her. And then at that time, I thought like, I should have went down. Like, should I go get her? Like, do I take that extra step? and go down to the boardwalk to look for her? Is she gonna be okay? Did she find someone to, you know, hang out with after the bar, like to hook up with? 
So I just chalked it up to that, and then I went home. And when I woke up in the morning, my grandmother knocked at my door, and she said, Shailene, were you out last night? I said, yeah. She said, uh, and then she told me there was a body found in the harbor of a girl. And I knew right away it was her, without even hearing her name. Another of Cheryl's friends who was at Smooth Herman's that night is Nadine Bernard. She remembers Cheryl being removed from the bar, and she was told Cheryl ended up in the drunk tank that night. Security kept telling me that she got thrown into a drunk tank. I always sober drove, and I never left anybody behind. That was the first time I left anybody behind, even though I waited till 5 in the morning, and a few hours later, I'm, I'm, I'm woken up and told that they found her in the waterfront or boardwalk. So that was hard. Cheryl's mother, Patricia Johnson, remembers every moment of the day she learned her daughter was gone. And the heartbreak remains as strong as ever. That Sunday was a beautiful day. Me and my friends were playing cards. I made Rose, that was her favorite. Knock on the door, see a cop. I was like, okay, like, but I didn't think it was her, like, that's my Cheryl Ann. Cheryl's friend Shailene tried to give the Cape Breton Regional Police Service her account of the night of Cheryl's death, but she was told the case was closed. I called them the next day. I called them that Sunday, the police, and I said, you know, I, I was talking to her and I just seen her when Probably, I was probably the last one to see her. Aren't you going to interview me? Well, I have stuff to say. And then the detective did call back, and uh, he said I had too much to drink that night. But I remember, and I'm just, like, feeling like, wow, I guess, they, I guess they're right, <laughs> you know? At that time, I accepted it. Now, now I don't. The official cause of death in Cheryl's case, according to the medical examiner's investigation, was drowning. There was no evidence of a sexual assault, though Cape Breton Regional Police Service has no record of a rape kit being ordered for Cheryl in her file. Cheryl's sister, Tricia, has pursued answers in her sister's case for years. Their response has given her neither clarity nor peace. Well, why were her pants down? And, and he went on to say, well, she could have been peeing and fell over and hit her head. Well, why was her bra pulled over her breasts and her, why was her shirt? And he said, well, it must have been the waves. Cheryl Johnson died more than 17 years ago, but her family continues to search for answers. Why was law enforcement so quick to close Cheryl's case? Is there hope that the case will be reopened? And how are a journalist and an artist supporting the family in their pursuit of justice for Cheryl? Cheryl Ann Johnson was a fun-loving 23-year-old woman from Eskasoni First Nation who went out on May 5, 2001 to Smooth Herman's Cabaret in downtown Sydney, Nova Scotia. Cheryl spent the evening with friends, then disappeared into the night only to be found dead the next day. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Cheryl Johnson, visit our website. Cheryl's family remembers her as having so much to live for. Her friend Shailene Johnson remembers her being in a good place when her life was cut short. She was going to university and she was working at citizenship and immigration with my mom, which was a pretty good job for that age, you know. It seemed like she was going on a really, really straight path, you know. She was focused on goals. Cheryl's mother, Patricia Johnson, remembers the details of her baby girl's life and her many beautiful qualities. When she was growing up, this baby, I remember all the times. When she was teething, she started walking. I can still remember her left. You know, all siblings getting to each other's nerves and 
but she was always like, she was always happy. As a little girl, Cheryl loved to swim and she loved to sing. She had a beautiful voice. We would just stand in front of the TV and sing and stuff, but then she'd be singing all day, every day. Between school, work, and taking care of the family, Cheryl always had time for her friends. She had a job. She loved kids. She wanted to be a social worker. She worked hard. She went to school every day. She was sort of like a nanny to one of her friends. And that was her every day. Like she would go to school, go to work. And at night when she was done, she would go see her friends. She was the life, right? The life of the party. I mean, it's like everybody wanted to be around her. Like many young people, Cheryl faced challenges in her life. However, when it was suggested by law enforcement that Cheryl might have taken her own life, this did not sit right with her family. Growing up, my sister, she was a bigger girl. She was a big girl. She was pretty. She had perfect teeth. But she was always struggling with her weight and depression. I never worried about her. Um, hurting herself or anything. I knew she wouldn't. When they found her and they suggested that she would do that, I felt like, like I knew in my heart that's not what happened, but if a cop tells you over and over and and they're supposed to be the ones that help you, um, that's just the way she died. They, they suggested like that she had went in the water herself. I said, no. She wouldn't. If you're a big girl, you're not going to expose yourself like that. Like, why would why would she unbutton her pants? Pull her bra over. Like, she wouldn't. She wouldn't want to be found like that, and she wouldn't. There have been several accounts about what happened to Cheryl after she left Smooth Herman's in the wee hours of May 5th, 2001. But it feels to some of those who want to share what they know that their accounts have not been taken into consideration by the police. If people took Indigenous women and, and they're missing seriously back then, they would have went that extra step. Why is it no foul play when they found her? When everything pointed to that it was for me and for any, every, any other citizen that had common sense, that a girl just doesn't end up in the Sydney Harbor with her pants down and her shirt up and no money. And she had money that night. Just doesn't make sense. Cheryl's sister, Lynn Johnson, does not believe that justice will be served in her case. It doesn't make sense to Lynn that law enforcement did not conduct a more thorough investigation or that Cheryl was missing $200, but a toonie remained in her pocket or that she could have put herself in a position of danger down by the shore when she had everything to live for. There's not going to be any closure. There's too many cases, and they're not going to go to every individual one, no matter how much evidence they might have piled up against them. Whoever threw her over, put her in there, or whatever. But those bruises on her knuckles didn't happen when she was being banged up against those rocks. When I was looking at her in the casket, I was like, oh, I've seen a cut over there. You know, well, that it all they were saying from the rocks. She was, if it was from the rocks, her whole dad, her whole face would have been effed up, not just right there. And it just doesn't seem right. Her, her losing all this money, her being found this way, especially when she was one of the highest points of her life at this time. The case of Cheryl Johnson may never be solved, but her family, her friends, and their allies are relentless in their quest for the truth. In her 23 years, Cheryl made an impact on many people, including an artist who was inspired to bring Cheryl's memory into the public eye. Could the work of a team of journalists shed new light? Can raised awareness help lead to justice? Although 23-year-old Cheryl Johnson's death in the wee hours of May 6, 2001, 
on the shore of Sydney Harbour, Nova Scotia, was not considered suspicious by law enforcement. Her family, friends, and many others believe there to be unanswered questions. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Cheryl Johnson, visit our website. Journalist Holly Moore is the producer of APTN Investigates. She is dedicated to the truth and justice in the cases of Canada's missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The system is so against families and their victims. The system is not set up to inform. It's not set up to give people information about their loved ones. One of the first cases I worked on, the police file had been lost. This is a woman who was searching for her daughter. The police file, it just didn't exist. And she kept running into brick wall after brick wall. And I said, okay, well, let's do an access to information request. And suddenly the whole tone changed. The way that the cops, uh, that the police interfaced with her, the way that the police communicated with her. So I really feel like it's extraordinarily important to shine a light on these cases as media because people are, are powerless before these vast systems. Um, and not to say that families are helpless because they aren't. They are motivated, courageous uh, together, but I really think that my role is to help people get the information that they need. As Holly and her team dug into Cheryl's case for the award-winning series, APTN Investigates, they found that the file Cape Breton Regional Police Service had put together presented room for further examination. I think that they were unprepared for how much this family was willing to give up and go through in order to get Cheryl Ann's files. So they underestimated the family. I actually interviewed the two, off two officers and I took them through the file. And I said, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. This is inconsistent. There was such a denial that, that there could be anything opened there that I felt like I was talking to kind of a brick wall. And I understand authority. I understand why we need police. I think they do an exceptional job, but I also believe that they have to be flexible. And when they're presented with evidence that doesn't match the narrative that they set up, they have a duty to go in and reopen and re-interview those witnesses. When Taken reached out to Cape Breton Regional Police Service to invite them to participate in an interview for Cheryl Johnson's story, they provided this statement. We have dedicated significant time and resources to answering similar detailed questions for other similar feature stories and programs. Less than one year ago, with Holly Moore for another APTN program, APTN Investigates, and we simply do not have the time and resources to continue doing so. Maybe you can access the information provided to APTN previously, which would answer these same questions you have again now. We will not be participating with an interview for your current program. Cheryl's family has been doing their own investigating. Her sister, Trisha Johnson, fought for all the information she was entitled to. The first thing I did was file my Freedom of Information. The one thing I didn't understand was, why did it take seven years to even show us her autopsy or her toxicologies? And when we went in to look at her file, the cops said, we don't have much time and we, we could skim through it. And when it was over, he said, the case is now closed and all the evidence is gonna be destroyed. And I didn't understand, like I said, how can any evidence be destroyed? Community members are showing Cheryl's family their support and helping make sure her story is not forgotten. Artist Sasha Doucette had her own way to show that she cares. Well, it started with Jamie Black. She had her red dress installment and it was to bring awareness to the missing and murdered women. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be a part of it. So I take my red dresses and then I take them to wherever somebody has passed away, like Cheryl, she passed away at the Sydney waterfront. I just take a few pictures here and there. It's a, an awareness project. Cheryl's sister Lynn has a message for anyone who has any information about her sister's death. 
I just hope they come forward. Like, what if it was one of your, one of your own family members? What would you do? If Cheryl's mother, Patricia, could see her daughter again. If she walked into that door, I would run, give her the biggest hug, and tell her I love you. I always loved her and still love her. I'm going to continue to fight for her. And I'll keep telling her story until it's heard. Somebody has information and I said, I'll get to the bottom of it someday. I'll never give up. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the death of Cheryl Johnson, visit our website.